Okay, so why don't we get started with our program this evening. Thanks all again for joining us for our June Advocacy Institute here at the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Uh, this month, we are focusing on gene therapies. And in particular, we're focusing on policies, programs, efforts, uh, additional ways in which uh, gene therapy development is uh, intending to be accelerated and hopefully with an FDA approval accessed from there. So let's just do a couple housekeeping items before we get into our content here as we move to the next slide. Um, here's the agenda in front of you. We really have kind of three main topics today and I'll get to our speakers here just momentarily. But we're gonna start off uh, talking about the great work that the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences within the NIH is doing to advance uh, gene therapy development, really trying to overcome some of those most challenging or most intractable uh, issues that are still standing in the way of widespread gene therapy uh, development and subsequent access. From there, we're going to talk about regulatory efforts to accelerate gene therapy development, uh, including some of the efforts happening up at the Food and Drug Administration, uh, all intended again to try to get more gene therapies to the neuromuscular disease community that much more quickly. We're then going to shift gears to once a gene therapy is approved, what access challenges may actually occur and what programs are being developed to try to address those access challenges, try to increase the number of folks who can actually access uh, gene therapies approved by the Food and Drug Administration. And then, of course, we'll take your questions as well. And really, we can take your questions throughout. And to do that, if we can move over to the next slide, uh, define where to ask us questions. You go over to the bottom right hand uh, corner of your screen. You see those three little dots there? And then if you click those three little dots, that brings you to the Q&A. The Q&A really is the best place to submit your question. And if, of course, it's on topic and one of our speakers here is able to address it, we'll be sure to perhaps even bring it up uh, at, the, at the close of each of our presentations, including at the close of uh, Dr. PJ Brooks's presentation as uh, he's, he's unable to join us for our full hour. Uh, but of course, we'll have a dedicated time at the end to try to do our very best to answer your questions that you may have about policies, programs, efforts, et cetera, that are impactful in the development of new gene therapies. One final thing I'll note is that on the bottom left hand of your screen is the little CC button if you would uh, like to utilize closed captioning for our program today. So why don't we move along to our next slide? And actually, before I get there, I will also mention this is being recorded. So just in case some of you are furiously trying to take notes at home, I don't encourage that. Sit back and listen and learn. The recording will be available uh, in not so distant future, I'd say, uh, so that if there's anything that you miss from us as we're talking about all these uh, great programs and these great efforts, uh, you can always tune back in then and catch up on what you might have uh, missed. So I failed to introduce myself at the beginning, but I can do it now. I am Paul Melmeyer. I'm Vice President of Public Policy and Advocacy at the Muscular Dystrophy Association. And in my role, I uh, focus on the entire spectrum of policy that we work on, including access to care, including breaking down societal barriers for uh, those with disabilities. But my focus here today will be on talking about those regulatory uh, efforts, programs, initiatives at the Food and Drug Administration, and actually also in Congress, that are all aimed at trying to increase the number of gene therapies available. We also have Dr. PJ Brooks, who is the Acting Director for the Division of Rare Diseases Research uh, Innovation at the National Center for Advancing uh, Translational Sciences. And uh, Dr. Brooks will be talking about the efforts that NCATS is working on to try to uh, accelerate the development and subsequent access of gene therapies for uh, the rare disease community and maybe even beyond from there. And then we're also very grateful to have uh, Margarita Valdez Martinez, the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy joining us as well. So as we take down our slides and as I transition over uh, to PJ uh, so that uh, PJ can get us started, let me introduce uh, Dr. Brooks uh, to, the, to the crowd here. So uh, Dr. PJ Brooks is the acting director of NCATS's Division of Rare Disease Research Innovation, also the working group uh, co-coordinator for the NIH's Common Fund Program on Somatic Cell Gene Editing and one of the leaders of the Platform Vector Gene Therapy or PAVE-GT pilot project, as well as the co-chair of the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium, and also represents NCATS in, in ERDRC, the International Rare Disease Research Consortium. So with that, Dr. Brooks, why don't I hand it over to you to talk about some of these exciting programs? Great, thank you, Paul. Uh, looking forward to talking to uh, this group this evening. Um, I have no 
disclosures other than if I make any statements or opinions, they're only mine and not those of the NIH or anybody else. So I think all of you are familiar with NCATS, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, where our mission is to turn research observations into health solutions through translational science. And ultimately to bring more treatments for all people more quickly. And that particularly involves a focus on rare diseases. Um, and the focus of today's talk is on gene therapy, which is of, of great interest to us because you know we're seeing increasing numbers of, of rare diseases. Now we're estimating there's about 10,000 or so, but a great majority of them are single gene diseases and are particularly amenable to gene therapy. And really what we're doing with gene therapy is delivering the therapeutic gene using, using viral vectors. And these are really like delivery boxes, you might think that are pre-addressed to go to certain cells and tissues. And given that that's true, you, you might envision that we can develop these as really as therapeutic platforms and, and doing that may speed the process of bringing these new treatments into the clinic. So one of the things we developed at, at NCATS and now involves other parts of the NIH is what we call the PAVE-GT program or platform vector gene therapies. We sort of think of this as a public AV gene therapy effort. The idea is to take four diseases under study at the NIH Clinical Center, uh, all diseases of no commercial interest. And if we keep the same viral vector and the same route of administration and the same production methods and only change the therapeutic construct, can we um, streamline the process of, of starting up clinical trials? And so we plan to bring this, this approach forward and propose certain streamline to the FDA. But as they respond to us, we plan to make this information available to the public so people can kind of learn with us and we can benefit the whole field. And where we are now is we have a lead candidate for a, a metabolic disease called propionic acidemia. Um, in the spirit of making information public, we've actually applied for and obtained an orphan drug designation. And we've made that, that document public. You can find it on our website and there's a QR code. You can download a template and actually use it for your own drug designation application. We've got an interact meeting coming up, uh, or we've had an interact meeting and we have a pre-IND meeting coming up. And we plan to again, make more of these documents public and repeat them for other diseases. And this is a big group effort. Uh, all the people working on it are shown there. Um, in the interest of time, I can't go into a lot of details, but um, by all means, take a look at the website and, and uh, download that document. Uh, another effort going on that, that kind of came along after the PAVGT is what we call the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium or the BGTC. This is a public-private partnership that is organized by the Foundation for the NIH which importantly is not part of the NIH and allows us to work with private industry in ways that we couldn't otherwise. Uh, and particularly want to highlight the efforts and, and interest of Peter Marks, the director of CBER, in, in uh, getting this effort up and off the ground. It would not have gone forward without him. These are the various uh, participants in the BGTC, many different parts of the NIH, as well as various for-profit entities and, and some nonprofits as well. The money comes about half and half from um, private uh, funds and public or NIH funds as shown there. And so there's really two parts of this consortium that the shown on the top is some efforts more along uh, basic research uh, into AAV biology and finding ways to enhance vector generation and enhance therapeutic gene expression. But the biggest part is the clinical program where we wanted to identify, originally we were thinking about five or six different AAV diseases or, or diseases that are amenable to AAV gene therapy and sort of use these as test cases to build a streamlined path for going from the idea of a gene therapy all the way to a, a first in human clinical trial. And some of the harmonization we're doing as part of this is to try to identify a, a minimal set of critical quality attributes that could be measured and, and used to identify if a product is safe to go into humans, and also a minimal set of animal toxicology studies 
again, the idea of, of these minimal approaches is not to cut any corners, but really to think about what, what some of these toxicology studies can tell us and identify the ones that are really important and, and not have to take time and, and money with ones that, that are not essential. Um, because obviously bringing these things to the patients is quite expensive. So through a process that we've started by a, a public funding or a, a public uh, call for suggested diseases, we got 62 originally and finally cut it down to these eight, um, three ocular, three neurologic, and two that can be treated with systemic delivery. This is done on, on purpose because we wanted a, a variety of different uh, magnitudes of, of vector preparation to test out the streamline process. And we announced these just uh, about a month ago at the ASGC team meeting and are now starting to move forward with the exciting and yet daunting task of doing eight AAV gene therapy clinical trials in a, in a coherent manner uh, and develop this therapeutic pipeline. Um, yeah, streamline therapeutic process. And ultimately, this information will become uh, available into the public domain uh, via something that, in part, that we envision a sort of playbook for uh, AAV gene therapy clinical development. And then just mentioning another very exciting area for treating monogenic diseases, which is genome editing. Um, this is similar to gene therapy in the sense that it's a good approach for, for single gene disorders, but rather than putting a, a functional copy of the missing gene into cells, what you actually do is deliver enzymes that cut and paste and can correct the disease-causing mutations. And the first phase of the genome editing program, we had five different initiatives, uh, better animal models, assessing unintended biological effects, improving in vivo delivery of genome editing, it's a big component, uh, new genome editors, and a dissemination center. And we, we've kind of finished the first phase of this program as a five-year uh, phase one. And all of the information, or, or much of the information that was developed in the program is now available in this toolkit. And you can see the link there where you can go and look up the this data supporting the new genome editors or model systems or delivery systems. Um, see both published and unpublished data and really hope making some tools available that will ultimately be, be developed uh, clinically. We've now moved into phase two and are going to be funding several awards, uh, getting closer to the clinic or in some cases even into the clinic. Uh, one initiative is focused on better assays that can be used for the regulatory, uh, for regulatory studies, at least that's our hope. We plan to fund multiple studies that would get all the way to the point of, of, of an IND and with the idea that those can be picked up by private industry and brought forward. Um, we'll also have a translational dissemination center. But I just want to highlight you know, one of the programs, one of the funding opportunities we did here. And this is one that actually requires uh, genome editing clinical trials, but but with the requirement that you do more than one disease because genome editing is really a therapeutic platform and we feel it's important that it be developed as such to really benefit all the patients who can benefit from genome editing. Currently, um, from the industry standpoint, even though these are therapeutic platforms, they're typically developed to treat one disease at a time, but we really want to spur on the idea of doing these as therapeutic platforms. So we had this funding opportunity. And finally, we're very excited to have a, a prize competition that we announced about a month ago. And the idea here is rather than fund research grants to have this sort of X prize competition for either programmable delivery agents that would allow deliver of genome editors to specific cells and tissues in a programmable and rational way, or for non-viral approaches that would cross the blood-brain barrier and deliver genome editors to multiple cells in the brain in a clinically relevant um, proportion of cells. And so we're very interested in this different approach. We hope to get some different uh, people applying rather than the, the standard uh, academic people that we get. And so the first submission deadline is October 5th. 
Um, happy to answer any more questions about that. Um, there's some of the links there. And I will stop there um, and happy to answer any questions. All right, awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, PJ. And we can, uh, why don't we take down the PJ slides and put up our, our slide deck again. And as that's happening, Mark told me that it uh, turns out that uh, the Q&A box might have actually been disabled at the start of our uh, webinar. Apologies to any of you who heard me say, go to those three buttons and find the Q&A, and you did, and it wasn't even there. It would have confused me as well. But the good news is it is back. So if you have any questions uh, for Dr. Brooks, uh, please uh, do put them in the chat as uh, he does need to uh, go on his way so he won't be staying for the uh, Q&A at the end of our call uh, today. Um, maybe just one question that I can uh, start with for you then, Dr. Brooks. I know that there are a handful of neuromuscular diseases included in some of these programs, of course, within Pave GT, I believe yes. there's um, uh, some congenital myasthenic syndromes, if I'm remembering off the top of my head. That's and then correct, yes. In uh, the uh, Bespoke Gene Therapy uh, Consortium, there's also the um, Charcot Marie Tooth uh, 4J. So for, for those uh, folks who are looking at these diseases and, and perhaps are not seeing theirs, um, what, what promise would you say that these programs hold for those diseases that maybe aren't included in the initial cohort, but still very well could, of course, benefit from the progress of these programs? Yeah, I think I think within Pave GT we are trying to disseminate some of the learnings as we try to identify uh, and exploit the the therapeutic platform that AAV is. And we, we, as I said, we've already made one of these documents available, and we'll continue to do that. Um, and really, the the major focus of the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium is to develop this streamlined pathway to make it as efficient as possible to start up an AAV gene therapy clinical trial um, with the idea that that should benefit all subsequent AAV gene therapy clinical trials. Um, and we also hope that by making the process more efficient, we can really lower the bar as to what constitutes a disease of commercial interest. So maybe diseases that would not be of commercial interest now as a result of some of these efforts will become of commercial interest later. Um, and then I think more generally, we talked about genome editing, which is a very exciting technology and the ability to deliver genome editors to multiple cells and tissues and um, in, a, in, a, in a targeted way. And of course, one we might get in applications for delivery to the muscle. Um, which would be very exciting. I mean, I, I can't, I don't know yet. We've just kind of opened up the, the process, but um, that would be something that would be very exciting also. Yeah, um, that, I mean, that, that's always how I've explained these uh, NCATS programs or just uh, broader gene therapy programs within NIH as well, and that in many ways you all are trying to write the playbook, not necessarily, of course, just for those diseases in which are, they're included in the current effort, but in the playbook can then be disseminated widely across uh, those in the field, both in the context of biopharmaceutical companies, but even preclinical work for that matter, uh, to make diseases previously that were less attractive, perhaps for gene therapy development, that much more attractive because you all have, I won't say solve some of the challenges, that's probably maybe too strong no. a word, maybe you would <laughs> say that, but at least, you know, gone through the journey and you can write about it and, and, and tell those in the community, how you overcame them perhaps, or what to expect in certain ways to just make it a little bit let more, a little more predictable for the gene therapy yeah. developmental community. That's that's definitely true. And I'm really glad you made that point because I, I'll tell you that, that those decisions were very difficult, um, particularly within the BGTC. I actually didn't directly participate in the decision because I know a lot of the families and the investigators. I didn't feel like I could be objective. We had a whole, I'm also not a clinician. So we had a whole clinical team that did a wonderful job in making those choices. But it, 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 it's still, you know, disappointed to the groups that, that didn't get selected. But I think what we really want to emphasize is the goal of this is not just to fund a few gene therapy trials. It's to really change the whole process and in, in a way that will ultimately benefit everyone. So I'm glad you brought that up. Absolutely. Just one question that we have in the Q&A for you, uh, PJ, and this comes from Donovan. And Donovan asks, will this process be used for uh, non-viral gene therapies? And actually, I'll, I'll actually add on to Donovan's question as well. Even are there efforts ongoing within these efforts 
for those who have already been exposed to AAVs, particularly AAV9, uh, and so uh, re-exposure isn't an option. Um, I think to get to the first question, I think I, I with the BGTC, I, I would think that some of the learnings that we can develop will be applicable to other types of therapeutic platforms. Um, you know, we've we've had some discussions about whether it, it's it's scary to think about because we're just starting BGTC one, but there was even talk about what about BGTC two, and you know that we'd have to see there. But but I think the general idea of coming up with like a standard minimal set of toxicology studies that could be applied to non-viral vectors as well. Um, so I think there will be some benefit. And in terms of the second question, I think there's a lot of effort going on into looking into how you can redose people. Um, that's not something that we're specifically looking at in either of these two programs, but uh, I do know that there's a lot of exciting activity there in terms of better ways to modulate the immune system, um, which I think is a, is a huge problem or a huge issue for the field in any case. And I think, uh, the potential for redosing, um, I think, is getting closer. We're not there yet, but I do think there's been some important uh, scientific breakthroughs in that area. Awesome. All right. Well, PJ, I think with that, uh, we're going to thank you for your time and for joining us uh, this evening to give us updates on the really exciting work that NCATS is doing. So exciting, I'll mention that NDA is actually one of the founding members of the NCATS Alliance, which is an alliance of patient organizations, provider orgs, and others all uh, aligned together to uh, really uh, evangelize the work that NCATS is doing, trying to break down the barriers still in front of gene therapy development. So, yeah, EJ, we very, we very much appreciate that, Paul, um, the, Absolutely. the efforts of Absolutely. the NCATS Alliance. And uh, I am happy if, if there's other questions that come up, um, Paul, if you want to send them to me, I'll be happy to answer them offline and, and you can get them back to whoever asked. Sounds very good. All right, PJ, thank you again for the time this evening. Why don't we uh, move along then thank with you. our program? Uh, we're going to now uh, talk about uh, when therapies are actually moving their way through clinical development. They've actually uh, perhaps overcome some of the challenges that PJ has been discussing that the uh, uh, efforts that NCATS has led are trying to tackle. Uh, and now they're perhaps actually in clinical development, they're in clinical trials, they're making their way through FDA's prescribed process for regulatory approval. What is uh, the environment there for uh, developments and regulatory consideration of these uh, of these gene therapies? So we know that we already have two gene therapies approved for neuromuscular diseases at the moment, which is very exciting for me to say, because as of uh, essentially this time last week, uh, we only had one gene therapy approved for neuromuscular diseases, and that was Olgensma for SMA. But it was just last week when uh, the FDA and Sarepta announced that Sarepta's gene therapy for uh, boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, now called Elevitis, was approved. So we have two, but all of the remaining neuromuscular diseases still do not have an approved gene therapy. And even in the context of Zolgensma and Elevitis, of course, there are very narrow indications. And so consequently, many individuals with SMA and Duchenne, of course, will be unable to access uh, those gene therapies, at least for the time being. So what regulatory efforts are ongoing to accelerate gene therapy? And actually, to move to the next slide, I don't want to start at the FDA. I want to start at Congress, because Congress, of course, is those who actually oftentimes commission the efforts and the programs and, of course, uh, write the statutory authority that FDA has to conduct new programs or to try to accelerate therapeutic development in gene therapies. And I want to start with what Congress did last year, because Congress actually uh, put together a number of really important new initiatives as part of their user fee reauthorizations. Now, this is something we've talked about in past uh, advocacy institutes. The user fees are the uh, fees that industry pays into FDA in order for FDA to review therapies in a timely and thorough manner. Uh, and in return for these fees, then FDA also will oftentimes run certain programs and initiatives that have been uh, negotiated. Now, these have to be reauthorized every five years. They were reauthorized last year. It was at the end of September of last year. 
And as part of that reauthorization, Congress commissioned a number of new gene therapy programs. And the uh, headline to the right side of your screen, which is uh, authored by uh, Nancy Myers of uh, Catalyst Healthcare Consulting, really paints the picture. FDA user fee programs, FDA CBER is the clear winner. CBER is the Center for Biologics, where the gene therapy efforts are housed. So let me just tell you a few things that Congress did. For one, they greatly increased the staffing within the Office of Therapeutic Products, which is actually a brand new quote unquote super office. And yes, that is the actual official uh, title for this kind of office. It's not a colloquialism, it's in, it's in code, it's called a super office. Um, and this is a brand new, much expanded, much more substantial effort with an FDA in which they're actually hiring hundreds of new staff within the Office of Therapeutic Products to actually be able to thoroughly review all the gene therapies that are gonna be in front of the FDA over the course of the next five years. Also within this uh, piece of legislation, Congress commissioned efforts to streamline chemistry manufacturing and control efforts for gene therapies, um, also known as CMC for short. Uh, and this is because oftentimes with gene therapies in particular, the CMC efforts from FDA weren't always aligned with the expedited review programs or weren't always aligned with developmental timelines. Sometimes it could actually be the main reason for why gene therapies weren't moving as quickly through FDA um, as, as they could be. And so consequently, with industry seeing this issue, FDA seeing this issue, and Congress seeing this issue, they addressed this through the legislation. Also included were efforts to advance innovative new rare disease endpoints, which it won't be just limited to gene therapies, will be helpful across the board in rare disease drug development. It commissioned patient-focused drug development meeting and listening sessions on gene therapies, which I'll get to a little bit more here in a second, as well as required FDA to issue or update some new guidances, uh, including on expedited approval pathways. So why don't we move on uh, to the next slide? Uh, and this is where uh, FDA has already started to actually implement some of these programs, because while these were uh, commissioned in uh, the uh, late September of last year by Congress, already here, let's, let's say about nine months later, uh, Cong uh, FDA has already moved forward in a number of ways. Now, first of all, the super office is already up and running, and technically they FDA did that on their own. They announced that just a few days before this legislation was signed into law, but they saw that they were about to get a bunch of new staff. So they announced the new super office as it was. And sure enough, hiring has greatly increased. FDA has a goal of hiring uh, over 100, actually, I think maybe even over 200 new staff in this office, at least pretty close to 200 at the very least. And sure enough, the hiring uh, is, is going quickly with an office of therapeutic products trying to bring experts in to review these gene therapies. And then some of these listening sessions that were commissioned already also were conducted. And you see kind of two of those on the right side of your screen. It was in November that FDA held a listening session in which they invited folks uh, with uh, neuromuscular diseases, really anybody who could potentially benefit from a gene therapy to offer their perspectives on access and development of gene therapies. And then it was uh, just a few months ago in April where they held a, a, a webinar on methods and approaches for capturing post-approval safety and efficacy data on cell and gene therapy products. So the efforts only continue from here. We can move on to the next slide. I can tell you uh, some things that actually aren't necessarily user fee specific related, as in they weren't commissioned by Congress, but FDA is moving concertedly forward nonetheless. On the right side of your screen, you see Dr. Peter Marks. He's actually already been referenced by PJ in the previous presentation in context of really pushing the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium forward. And Dr. Peter Marks, he's the director of the Center for Biologics. So within CBER, he heads the entire effort and the gene therapy effort within the Office of Therapeutic Products is housed underneath Dr. Marks. And what Dr. Marks is doing is he's really trying to reform the gene therapy development and regulatory oversight even further than what Congress had actually commissioned within their user fee reauthorization last year. On the right, so this, this headline comes from Stat News. And it's actually, this headline comes from uh, MDA's conference, scientific and clinical conference back in March of uh, this year. So just a little over three months ago in which Dr. Marks joined us and he announced uh, there within the MDA con uh, conference that they want to start using the accelerated approval pathway more for gene therapies. And this is really meaningful because accelerated approval is different than the other expedited approval pathways or any uh, approval pathway for that matter, as it actually relies on a surrogate endpoint that reasonably predicts the clinical improvement in an individual taking the therapy. So actually in the latest context, just the Jushen gene therapy that was approved last week that was approved via accelerated approval and was actually the very first gene therapy 
that was approved via the accelerated approval process. So really groundbreaking stuff coming directly from what Dr. Marks had to say at our conference a few months ago. And this is important because we know within many gene therapies, uh, of course, they're trying to address the underlying uh, problem, if you will, within uh, the genetics of an individual that then leads to uh, the issue of, uh, and this is where I'm a, non a non-clinician, so I'll get uh, out of my depth quickly, um, but the proteins that are oftentimes critical to functioning, and of course, a neuromuscular disease is critical to muscle function, um, are, are not working as they should be because they're either lacking in protein entirely or have uh, less of a protein that is uh, necessary for a uh, quote unquote normal uh, functioning of the muscle. And so these gene therapies hold the promise of actually replacing these proteins, actually allowing for the DNA to code for these proteins that then result in these protein uh, generation within the cells. And consequently, the, the, the muscles can actually uh, work uh, better than they otherwise would at the very least, and maybe even in some contexts, at least for some amount of time, uh, more normally. And so consequently, if the protein is there, that means that one, it would follow that the uh, clinical benefit is there as well. And that's where this accelerated approval pathway can be really critical. Because if you can prove, if a company can prove that their gene therapy increases the presence of that protein, then the logic follows that the increased presence of that protein should mean that there is clinical benefit from there. Now, many are hesitant about this because uh, there are still some assumptions, as you can hear, within uh, that uh, logical pathway. Uh, but nonetheless, this is what Dr. Marks and folks aligned with Dr. Marks within Zebra are really pushing, a greater flexibility in the use of the accelerated approval pathway so more gene therapies can reach not just the neuromuscular disease community, but really the entire rare disease community in general. And to move to the next slide, this is kind of one part of his overall effort, which he's been talking about more, re more, more often and more recently called Operation Warp Speed for Rare Diseases. And this is an initiative in which, yes, he does want to use the accelerated approval pathway more for neuromuscular and other rare diseases, but he also wants to actually increase the dedicated FDA support to companies who are developing gene therapies in unmet rare diseases. And essentially, he's taking the model that was used in COVID, in which there was the Operation Warp Speed for COVID vaccines that, as we all remember, led to vaccines being developed at an incredibly rapid pace, much more rapidly than they're traditionally developed because FDA, or at least in part, because FDA was there really every single step of the way in rapid and continued communication with the biopharmaceutical company in question, which really cut down the amount of time necessary to develop the vaccine in those cases. But of course, what Dr. Marx is hoping for here really cuts down the amount of time necessary to develop and then approve a gene therapy for a rare disease. So th there, there is, of course, a dedicated FDA resources that would be put to this, as well as the expedited approval pathway use, but also international harmonization would be part of this, in which FDA would be working with their colleagues at the European Medicines Agency, up in Canada, in Japan, other regulatory agencies across the world, and really trying to uh, assist these biopharmaceutical companies not only to get an approval in one jurisdiction, but as quickly as possible, get an approval in all jurisdictions, thus also lowering the amount of time and money that's necessary to develop these gene therapies. So other things that Peter Marks and his folks within the Office of Therapeutic Products within CBER are working on are also potential eventual platform approvals in which if a company can prove that essentially everything is the same in addressing a genetic disease except for perhaps the transgene within the gene therapy, but the safety profile is the same, the vector is the same, the dosing is, is largely the same or maybe identical for that matter. The only thing that's different is the transgene, then there could be the consideration for platform approval rather than individual approvals that each will take several months to conduct. They're also working harder on the N of 1 paradigm because we know that uh, many gene therapies or many rare diseases for that matter are actually oftentimes maybe only one or a very small handful of individuals with that genetic disease. So consequently, what do, can there be done regulatory for those, regulatorily for those individuals? And you can see on the right side of your screen an article from uh, Biospace, I believe, in which the Operation Warp Speed was discussed, or for rare diseases, was discussed further. They're hoping to actually have this up and running by the end of this year. So let's move to the next slide. Um, so just to kind of um, conclude before uh, handing over uh, the conversation to uh, Margarita Valdez-Martinez on access, just to conclude with some of these 
therapeutic development and regulatory efforts mostly happening at the Food and Drug Administration. This is all well and good. This is all really exciting. And this should mean that there should be more gene therapies available for those with neuromuscular diseases going forward. But there still are a few things that we need to remind ourselves of. The, the main hurdles in front of gene therapy still remain, in some cases, the fundamental scientific challenges that are underlying developing these gene therapies. And some of those things are what uh, Dr. Brooks and the folks at NCATS and others within the NIH are really trying to tackle. Issues with AAV toxicity, issues with the uh, gene being small enough to fit within a capsid, issues with immunogenicity, issues with, with other uh, factors in not only addressing monogenetic diseases, but addressing uh, diseases with um, that aren't caused by a single gene mutation. Many gene therapies still remain commercially unattractive in that they may only be able to benefit a handful of individuals and a, pro a for-profit biopharmaceutical company with that kind of calculus in front of them just is not generally going to be interested in developing that therapy uh, much further. And we're still going on kind of the one by one, one gene therapy by one gene therapy pace. And as we all know, of course, there are many neuromuscular diseases over, there are hundreds of genetic causes of neuromuscular diseases. But when you even zoom out from there, there are over 10,000 uh, genetic causes of rare diseases. So uh, the pace at which we're going at, of course, needs to be accelerated. But with these things in mind, a lot of what FDA is doing, a lot of what Congress has driven, and of course, a lot of what uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Brooks, folks at NCATS, folks at other efforts uh, are doing, really are trying to make this much more streamlined, much more quick. So we are getting some really fantastic questions in the Q and A. I think what I'm going to do, if it's okay, with uh, with some of these uh, with with Samuka here, we're going to hold these questions to the end of the Q and A because I want to give uh, uh, Margarita Valdez Martinez uh, plenty of time to talk about some of the access uh, challenges, but also promise that's uh, ongoing, perhaps with access to gene therapies. And before I hand it over to you, Margarita, let me. Just give a quick introduction to you so everyone knows who you are. So uh, Margarita Valtez Martinez, she's the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the American Society of Cell and G uh, Gene and Cell Therapy, or ASGCT as many of us know them, which is the primary professional membership organization uh, within the, the gene and cell therapy uh, area. Uh, through her work at ASGCT, Margarita is advancing the society's priorities and policy development with legislators, with providers, patient advocates, coalitions, really the entire stakeholder community with over 20 years of experience, uh, lots of success in health policy. And we only, of course, look forward to further success that Margarita and ASGCT will have from here. So, Margarita, with that, why don't I turn it over to you? Let's talk about the post-approval landscape. Once that gene therapy is actually approved by the FDA, what does the access landscape look from look like from there? Margarita, take it away. Sure. Thank you, Paul. I feel like you and PJ really set me up for success. So I'm, I'm happy to follow you. You really laid out a lot of the key programs that were um, included in Fedora and the end of year spending package. And we've seen, as you as you mentioned and, and shared, um, we've seen those roll out already. So we've seen some listening sessions expect some guidances to come down the pipe. Um, but I think what we know for certain is that this is a very robust pipeline for cell and gene therapies, and there's no signs whatsoever of it slowing down anytime soon, which is really fantastic because, um, as this audience knows very well, that oftentimes these therapies are given to people who have no other option. There's there's nothing else out there. So we're happy to see that and happy to represent the researchers that are developing this translational science. So actually in anticipation of seeing new therapies coming to fruition, ASGCT commissioned a study in 2022 to look at the coverage landscape, the coverage and access landscape for cell and gene therapies. And a part of that, research was to look at 16 different states and three MCOs. And so the states that were selected were based off of different parts of the country, different sizes, different political environments. And um, I know that uh, Paul and Mark are going to drop the, the link to the actual white paper in the chat. So you don't have to write down all of these states, but I'll just tick them off really quickly. Um, so the states that we looked at were Arizona, Arkansas, California, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, 
Indiana, Illinois, Massachusetts, Michigan, Mississippi, New York, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Oregon, and Texas. And if you can say that three times fast, congratulations. <laughs> um, and the MCOs that we looked at were United, Anthem, and Centene. So a little bit of a spoiler alert, um, and not going to be surprising to you at all, is that we saw that states are typically more restrictive in their coverage of cell and gene therapies. So we specifically looked at two gene therapies and one cell therapy. So we looked at Kimriya, which is a CAR T cell therapy, um, and we looked at Luxterna, a gene therapy for children and adults with inherited retinal dy dystrophy. And what will be most um, relevant to this audience is we also looked at Solgensma, which is a gene therapy to treat children with spinal muscular atrophy. Um, unfortunately, what we saw is that states were more, in general, more restrictive. So we looked at the coverage policies that were publicly available. Um, and that in itself, while it may seem like a simple thing to say like publicly available policies for coverage, and access, we found many states did not have publicly available policies that we could find. So for some of these states, we were not able to look at all three therapies, Mariah, Lister, and Solgensma. Um, for Solgensma, um, Arizona, Arkansas, Georgia, Illinois, Michigan did not have any public any policy publicly available. We also found that for Solgensma, in general, it was either not a publicly available policy or it was more restrictive than the label. So that was really concerning to us. And it tracked, unfortunately, it tracked with a lot of the anecdotal information that we've been hearing from our researchers and our provider members who were saying they were having difficulty giving treatments to patients because they were getting either drowned in paperwork. So we think there was um, there was a little bit of a push and pull there on um, prior authorization, or they were told that that their patients didn't qualify for this, even though we know that they did. So our thought process with it with this is to distill this information into a one feature and take that information to legislators um, and the administration. Because while we had some really good anecdotal information before, we now have an actual white paper that's been published in Molecular Therapy, which is one of our scientific journals, where we can say, look, this was a scientifically conducted overview. And we know for a fact that while these are two gene therapies and one cell therapy, we can kind of extrapolate that that's what's happening in the landscape. Um, some of the takeaways were, as I said before, states are narrowing coverage to populations covered in clinical trials despite the broader labeled indication. And that's really concerning to us. And as you as patient advocates know, that oftentimes the clinical trials are a much smaller population, um, but that's not the intended use for the therapies. So to see states limiting access to these therapies based off the clinical trial population, which is not the intent by the FDA when they approve it, we're concerned by that, um, especially because we know that the FDA has a wide scientific and legal attitude to establish the labeled indication for these therapies. So that's kind of the broad overview of what our takeaway was. And I think for many of you in the patient advocacy community, these findings are not in particularly shocking to you. But again, um, as a society representing the researchers conducting this translational science, we want to make sure that the patients receive access to these therapies because we can, as you know, have the best research out there and the best therapies. But if it's not getting to the patient populations that really need it, then, then that's a huge concern for us as a professional society. So Part of the issue is we just know that states have to balance their budget every year, and they're not really built for these one-time potentially durable or curative therapies. And we're seeing this kind of push and pull through prior authorization or trying to restrict um, the labeled indications. We are also seeing on a second bucket, we're seeing the administration try to take a bite of the apple and address some of these access issues as well. So on February 14th of this year, the administration dropped three different payment models, but two will be 
uh, proposed payment models, but two will be of particular interest to in this audience. One was a cell and gene therapy proposed payment model, and the second was accelerated approval payment model. So I'll start with cell and gene therapy first. So acknowledging some of the difficulties that states are having balancing their budgets, this proposed cell and gene therapy payment model would allow states to voluntarily opt in to outcomes-based agreements with other states and allow CMS to negotiate those outcome-based agreements. Um, the thought process so far for the administration is to look at one therapeutic area. So in their, um, in their press release, they highlighted sickle cell disease and they highlighted possibly cancer, but really it, it could be anything. I think those were just two areas that they mentioned. Um, and they are looking to have the CMMI develop an outline of a cell and gene therapy model this year, and then share what that outline looks like either in 2024 and 25 with a launch in 2026. That seems aggressive to me, but I've seen stranger things happen. So don't take my word for it. But either way, what we are seeing is an acknowledgement that we don't currently have a system that's built for these durable therapies. Um, and we are also seeing the administration and other stakeholders trying to find ways to think about how do you track patients over a period of 5, 10, 15, 20 years when sometimes they move states, sometimes they move jobs, sometimes, you know, they just, they uh, have a failure to comply and to check back in. So these are things that we're seeing that are, are on the radar of the current administration. So the other payment model that was proposed was accelerated approval. So as you may know, as Paul kind of eloquently touched on in his presentation, um, accelerated approval is what it says. It's an accelerated pathway, which many cell and gene therapies actually take advantage of this accelerated pathway because as we talked about, and as you know, there's small clinical trial populations. There's often a lack of natural history. And it may take years to, to conclude those confirmatory trials for a final approval. So what's concerning about this proposed payment model for accelerated approval is that it's looking at differential payments for um, therapies that are approved under accelerated approval versus final approval. So what that means in essence is that they're looking at paying less for any therapy that is approved under accelerated approval until the confirmatory trial is completed. So I will say that ASGCT absolutely supports confirmatory trials and the completion of the work to go toward them, but there should be considerations made for populations that will benefit for cell and gene therapies because of the unique nature of these, of these patient populations. So we have weighed in on this expressing our concern. I also want to be nuanced in saying that as a society, we do not advocate for particular price points. We do not advocate for any particular uh, company. Um, we are very much an individual membership organization, and 79% of our members are researchers. So we are pro-science and pro-access for the patients. And sometimes that requires us to, to lean into some of these policy issues that would limit access to the patient populations and to their families that need them. So those are those are two big buckets that I think would be of interest to this group. There's one um, looking at Medicaid access, especially as we're seeing more therapies come to market and we know that there's going to be larger and larger Medicaid populations hopefully taking advantage of these trans, you know, transformative therapies. And then we're also looking at what is administration's thoughts on helping states ensure that they have access and outcome-based outcome outcome -based agreements. Sorry, it's been a very long day. <laughs> um, so these are, these are things that are on our radar and we're weighing in, and we're also weighing in with legislators as well to make sure that we are highlighting the science and highlighting the need for patients to continue to have these therapies available for themselves and for the loved ones. So I think 
in short, that is the conclusion of my presentation. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Margarita. I mean, that was fantastic information on uh, what's going on right now, uh, both within challenges to accessing gene therapies in states and certain kinds of, uh, whether that be uh, Medicaid or, or other venues and well laid out within the white paper, which Mark did put in the chat. If anyone wants to go click on that link, that's how uh, you all can find uh, the great research that ASGCT uh, has commissioned and then published. Uh, but then also some of the programs out there trying to address particularly how gene therapies really kind of stretch our payment systems in ways that uh, makes our existing kind of antiquated coverage and payment schemes uh, not particularly work well for for uh, selling gene therapies, especially those who are durable, uh, as you mentioned. And of course, this is something that's on the forefront of our mind here at the Muscular Dystrophy Association, because again, with the approval just last week for Sarepta's uh, Elevitis for Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy, uh, these uh, this is a therapy that we know is going to be available probably to, our, in our estimation, about 400 to 500 boys who are going to qualify under the label, uh, about half of whom are covered by Medicaid, the other half of whom are covered by uh, private insurance. And so both private insurers and Medicaid programs, states are going to have to figure out how to pay for this list price of a $3.2 million gene therapy potentially in one go. So that's that's going to be challenging for any coverage entity that's going to have to navigate that. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, just one question of, of you, Margarita. And again, I will invite uh, questions to be put in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll also get to uh, at least one of these questions uh, Samuka has put in here. Uh, one of them is very clinical in nature. So I don't know if you have the right people on the call at the moment, but you never know. Uh, but to, to you first, Margarita, on, on Medicaid, I wanted to ask you, uh, Medicaid programs are, of course, required to cover FDA-approved therapies uh, because of the Medicaid rebate program, in which uh, the uh, biopharmaceutical manufacturer pays rebates essentially to the Medicaid program, but in return, the Medicaid program has to cover the therapy. Now, that, of course, doesn't exist within the context of private insurance, but one would think then that the gene therapy is going to be widely available in Medicaid, but that's that's not always the case because there are still challenges, barriers, slow walking, if you if you will, in which Medicaid programs aren't always covering these therapies uh, as much as they could or should be. So I, I don't know if you can comment on that, where Medicaid theoretically should be one of the best or better covers of gene therapies, but there are still are challenges for those in the Medicaid population trying to access gene therapies. Yeah, it, you, you said it really well, Paul. Um, in theory, yes, Medicaid should be one of the best coverage opportunities for patients trying to access these therapies. But then when we look at um, the need for states to balance their budget, if they have three to five patients with that are looking to receive a gene or cellular therapy, right there, their entire budget is out of whack. So I think that is why you know we're surmising that there are all of these slow walkings or restrictive coverage. Um, and quite frankly, those are from the states where we could find policies. It was really concerning to us that there were a number of states where we could not find any publicly available coverage policies. So it's really unclear to us if they are just outright denying patients or if they are being selective about it. So it's one thing, what we saw that was publicly available was concerning, but we're, we're also disturbed about what we couldn't find as well. Yeah, that that's well said because I would imagine if uh, as you as you as you mentioned, if it's difficult for you and the researchers aligned with you at ASGCT to find these, uh, you know, parents with a child with a, a rare disease looking to find that uh, uh, that that policy within their state's Medicaid page is going to be uh, nearly impossible. So. I think that's uh, that's very well said. So why don't we just broaden this a bit? I know we have uh, two questions in in the chat, and I'll also mention that uh, before uh, we get too far with the questions, uh, you see some resources here to, to for for where to find us. Of course, please visit us at nda.org backslash advocacy, but you can also text us to join us in our advocacy network at uh, by texting uh, MDA USA. Uh, to uh, 50457. And if you have any follow-up questions, you know, something hits you later tonight of, oh, I really should have asked that, uh, then uh, feel free to email us at advocacy at mdausa.org. So we have some good questions in the chat here. And I'll, I'll admit, I think the first one might be beyond our current capacity, but I'm going to read it off anyway. And it's from Samuka. And he asks, are there any safety risks that are being studied in regards to AAV and gene therapy? 
and how will these safety risks be addressed in the proposed framework? So Samuka, I, is, if, if uh, you're willing to uh, respond to this question in the Q&A, whether that was directed at uh, Dr. PJ Brooks, because if so, uh, I will be happy to uh, see if I can get that question to him and have that answered for you, because I will admit I am not the person to answer that question. Uh, and I, I don't know, uh, since we don't have a medical doctor on with us, if, if, if we have someone to answer that, but it's an excellent one. Uh, and, and perhaps we can have that answer for you uh, in short order after our conversation today. Your second question, though, is a good one, which is what is the anticipated timeline of expanding clinical trials to include adults whose diseases have progressed significantly? And really, again, the key here is with the endpoint. Uh, the endpoint that's used in a clinical trial, because oftentimes endpoints used in clinical trials rely in some way on ambulation. Of course, when many Duchenne trials, that could be the six-minute walk test. That could even be the North Star ambulatory assessment, which is used uh, and was used as the primary endpoint in the context of the uh, gene therapy that was just approved uh, for, uh, for, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Now, there is, of course, non-ambulatory studies happening in the context of Sarepta's Duchenne gene therapy. And so long as endpoints can be validated, or even if they're not officially validated, at least well understood to be a, an accurate measure of the disease and the experience of the disease, then so long as those endpoints can be used within those who are non-ambulatory and those who are perhaps more progressed within uh, the course of the disease, uh, then there's really no reason why clinical trials can't be getting off the ground there as well. And oftentimes we do see that the case. But as I think uh, we all are also familiar with, oftentimes these clinical trials in the non-ambulatory non -ambulatory population follow the clinical trials in the ambulatory population. As those who are ambulatory, there's uh, oftentimes they're not quite as progressed, so there's perhaps less heterogeneity, and also uh, the endpoints are perhaps more established or, or easier to measure. So it's difficult to uh, necessarily give a precise timeline, Samuka, but uh, generally speaking, so long as those endpoints are being developed and they're being accepted by FDA and used in clinical trials, there really is nothing uh, truly holding back uh, uh, therapeutic uh, development within non-ambulatory populations uh, compared to ambulatory populations. So we also have a question, and I think this might have to be our final question because we are here with one minute to the hour. But this is what can be done to lower the price of these therapies to ensure that Medicaid can cover these therapies without significant barriers? Well, it's a good question, and it's a very difficult question to answer for a number of reasons, because uh, one could actually respond to that question with the question of, do we really need to? Because in the context, let's take Zolgensma, for example, which was at a list price of $2.1 billion. So one of the uh, most discerning eyes, if you could say, the Institute for Clin Clinical and Economic Re uh, Review that actually does cost effectiveness analyses of these various different therapies, and by and large find most prices to be actually not cost effective uh, for therapies as they reach the market, they actually found that that $2.1 million price tag was actually uh, cost effective compared to the benefit that Zolgensma in this case brings to those with SMA. The health benefits, the life benefits that that therapy actually brings, even at $2.1 million, is worth it and is worth it to our uh, healthcare system as well. So one could say, well, actually, maybe that high price tag, at least in many cases, is appropriate. So in, instead, perhaps a question to, to ask is, since these high price tags are so burdensome on Medicaid, how can we spread out that over time. So a Medicaid program perhaps doesn't have to pay 2.1 or in the context of Duchenne, $3.2 million in one fell swoop. And that's where the one of the programs that Margarita mentioned in which uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services in particular, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, CMMI, is looking into testing whether CMMI working with state Medicaid agencies can negotiate outcomes-based agreements in which the payment can be spread out more over time and consequently, state Medicaid agencies don't have to worry about paying $3.2 million a pop for access to a gene therapy, perhaps could pay that over time, making it much more, uh, much more manageable for a state and for a state's Medicaid budget. So there's, there's a lot of ideas out there, certainly $3.2 million, 2.1, 3.5, you know, whatever, whatever million dollar number you want to throw out there is going to be very, very difficult for both private and public payers. But if that is actually worth it with the uh, health benefit that the therapy brings, which as we know within the context of many gene therapies, these are absolutely transformational therapies. And in the context of being able to spread it out, it actually may be more economical than some existing therapies or other forms of therapies 
that are, you know, the pill, the infusion, the thing that one takes every week, every two weeks, whatever it happens to be. Um, so uh, I think those are the policy challenges that we're trying to tackle. So with that, I think we find ourselves actually two minutes after the hour, and I have rambled as I usually do. So thank you all for joining us this evening. A big thank you to uh, Dr. PJ Brooks for joining us, uh, Margarita Valdez Martinez of ASGCT for joining us. We hope this was informative. Again, this will be uh, posted on MDA's advocacy page a little ways down the line. So if you want to watch the recording, you can watch it there. And please keep a close eye on our advocacy network. Uh, we will very likely have opportunities for you to get involved very shortly that have to do with access to gene therapies, have to do with access to genetic medicine more broadly for that matter. So join us, mda.org backslash advocacy or text MDA USA to 50457. And thank you again for joining us tonight.